I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast. Joining me today is a man that is beloved the world over. If you're a swim fan, you know his name. He's been around a long time. He's a fighter. He's got passion. He's someone that you want to pull for at all times. Today, we're talking to Bruno Fratis, the recent bronze medalist in the men's 50 freestyle at the 2020 Olympic Games. How you doing, buddy? What's up, swim swimmers? Uh, man, such an honor to be talking to you here, Mel. Thanks for thanks for the invitation, man. explain to people a little bit of what you're like in terms of my personal experience. And I, there, there's one sprint event that we go to, it's in up in Kentucky. It's a pro race. It's, it's, it's entertainment. It's fun, but I've, I've, I was able to rub shoulders with you and spend some time with you. Um, but it, you know, whenever I've engaged you in text message or any sort of co- communication, uh, or anyone, I've, anytime I've ever talked about you, I've always referred to you as a swim star. And you said, not yet. <laughs> Not yet, Mel. You would always correct me. What did you mean by that? I don't consider myself a swim star. Uh, in my mind, every time I look in the mirror, I see that same kid that loves to swim and still chasing goals bigger than life, you know? And uh, maybe I have just accomplished one of these big goals I have, which is an Olympic medal, but there's still, there's still so much more I want to accomplish in the sport of swimming. You are, let's just say this, owning the Olympic hardware, owning that piece, owning that medal is a piece of history. And, and for athletes, you know, I wish it wasn't just the Olympic games. I wish it was that we were, we could be judged for the totality of all the experiences and races and uh, it wasn't this one moment, but it is. And now you've got your piece of history. Are you feeling the love personally? And are you feeling it back home in Brazil? I don't think I, don't think I have an exact notion of the appreciation that it's coming from Brazil. Of course, I came straight from Tokyo back to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where I live with my wife and dogs. And I haven't had the chance of going to Brazil just yet. I was just talking with my agent at the phone earlier today and trying to find the opportunity to go to Brazil and feel a little bit of this love uh, as soon as possible because it's just something, the amount of messages, the amount of love I've been receiving from back home is just, it's just crazy. I mean, I could imagine that earning an Olympic medal would bring such feedback, but when it comes, I mean, when you feel it for real, it's just, overwhelming yeah it is it's um you've got a long storied history and uh and 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 i i do think anybody that knows you really likes you as a person and uh i appreciate that thank you yeah i I think that i I, you know i I, what people don't realize when they're not talking and they're not hanging out among elite athletes is that everybody gets close the world is very small we all know each other everybody knows everyone but I, I think that rolling into Rio in 2016, I think that you had a lot of people, U.S. fans, fans around the world, your own peers. They, they really wanted to see and, ex- and expected a performance in 16. They felt like you were coming on fast. Um, does this feel like redemption from 16? It does feel like redemption. Uh, coming to Olympic Games, I think I had this the first or second time that we're ranking by that time going to the Olympics and uh, a medal felt almost certain. Not, all, not, not so much myself. I, I didn't feel that so much myself, but the, the rest of the team. And as I said, the peers and, and everybody who was following and, and rooting for swimming in Brazil. And that didn't happen. So the disappointment in Rio was, again, it, it was not so much, a disappointment for myself, but I felt like I let down a lot of people. So coming back home with a medal after Tokyo, it's almost like uh, I was able to apologize for for things that didn't happen in the past, and now I'm able to 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 give this gift 
to, to my community, to my country, to everybody who has been with me along the way. For context and perspective on the run up to 2016, um, you know, you, you're, you came onto the scene pre-2012. You went to the London Olympic Games. Um, you were 0.02 off the podium. You know, just a fingernail yeah. off the podium in 2012. 2014 U.S. fans really got to know you because you were a gold medalist at the Pan Pacific Games. You won. Pan Pax, yes. Pan Pax, excuse me. Yeah, Pan Pax. And it's uh, World Championships. You had the bronze medal. In 16, you, you know, everybody, e- e- even if you're from another country, you're like, I kind of want to see Bruno do well here. I know the disappointment of going to Olympics and not having the Olympics you want. I, I had that experience. Um, it took me... It took me years to overcome it. I think there was depression. There was a lot of weight. How long did it take you to recover from 16 emotionally? Yeah, it was not only an Olympic disappointment, but it was a home Olympics disappointment. I think that nothing can possibly get you ready to stepping on the deck of an Olympic final and having that entire Olympic stadium just, chanting your name and you have your family and you have friends i mean i was born in rio at rio in rio state so that was my home state so that had some weight to it you know so i just wanted to give it back to people all that love i just wanted to give a medal back but coming out of rio it's it was the same thing it was depression it was a feeling of disappointment a lot of bad feelings it took me about six months until I realized that I didn't want to, I didn't want to to finish my career that way. Because of course, after after such disappointment, you're you're obviously considering retiring, right? And uh, it took me about five to six months until I realized that uh, I mean, myself and my career deserved a better ending if it was supposed to end, right? Your recovery was was okay. I, I understand the depression after a big disappointment. And, and on such a personal platform and a personal stage, your home country. But you wouldn't have known it at the 2017 World Championships. 2017 World Championships, you were on. Uh, that was your personal best time. I don't think that you even have gone faster than two. You went 21.27. Is that correct? In the yeah, that's my, PB, that's my PB to, to this day. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lightning fast swim. That's... Uh, I. I I, I do want to make in a silver medal, great swim, um, but it brings together, it brings up another thought when I think of you, and this might not be fair. You might be like, Mal, I hate you. I don't agree with this, but uh, uh, I think pound for pound, you might be the great one. If you're not the greatest among the handful of the greatest <laughs> sprinters that has ever lived, because I'm, I don't, you're, you're, you've got muscle, you're, you're big guy, but you're not the tallest guy. It's, it's just what it is. I mean, I could, I had every opportunity you can think of, of making it an excuse out of it, you know? And um, you, you talk about being the, the greatest pound for pound sprinter, but it's, it, that's just not the way swimming works. The way swimming works, whoever puts their hand in the wall first, it, it's the greatest, it's the fastest, it's the champion. So I'd rather not use that as an excuse and instead finding ways of, um, of just swimming faster and keep improving. I mean, as you mentioned, my PB, it's uh, it's from uh, 2017 swim. And just recently, a couple of days ago, me and Michelle, he and Brad, of course, we made the decision of going three more years uh, towards Paris. So we definitely want to to place a few more PBs heading towards my my fourth Olympics. And it's... um... And you just you just dropped it. So you, you work with you work remotely with Brett Hawk, as I understand yeah. it. Yeah, and, he, uh, he visits eventually, but he's not able to be here uh, to the entire uh, to the entire season. Uh, but for the most part, it's um, your 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 training. I mean, I've seen your training. Your tra- I, I follow your Instagram account. If you're not following this guy on Instagram, then you don't fully understand something. You got to follow. What is your way to say? What is your handle? You're just on my, what's your handle? You got to drop your handle right here for Instagram. Just at Bruno Freitas. That, that's, that's it. Okay. It's at Bruno Freitas. You, you got it. You, you can't get it wrong. 
So what, what I love about it is you give people a peek inside of the, the things that you do, which are, you know, for me, an old school guy, I, I, it's hard for me to understand, but it's, um, it's some really innovative, interesting training. How long have you been training essentially alone? Alone, I've been training since the end of 2016. That was one of the changes that uh, I, I wanted to do to this Olympic cycle heading to Tokyo that I felt like was going to be the best for me. I had worked with uh, large teams, uh, Pinheiro's team back in Brazil, and of course, when I moved to, to the U.S., I trained with the Auburn uh, Aquatics. I like to call it the Auburn Aquatics family because that, that's how it felt. It was an amazing experience. Even though I've never been to college in the U.S., swimming with a collegiate team, it, it was definitely what took my swimming to a next level, my competitiveness to a next level. But uh, after 2016, I needed not only some alone time, but also understand things a little better instead of just been racing throughout the entire season at every single practice. I need to understand better what would be my own program and my own way of getting faster, you know? So since after Rio, I started training by myself, Michelle, Michelle Lenhard, she's my wife and also coach. And uh, she's the one every day on deck and Brett Hawk, legendary Brett Hawk. I call him uh, the, the real life Yoda. You know, the guy's just a sprint guru and uh, he he's on and off and he, he sends workouts and we discuss workouts and he coached me remotely and just it's just a perfect fit for me. So let's 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 entertain our, 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 our listeners a little bit. What is a recovery day for you like is a recovery day hot tub suntan? It, it depends. It depends a lot. You mentioned that you're an old school guy, right? But back when you were racing, swimmers used to retire at what, 24, 25? And I didn't have my first Olymp and my first world championship medal until I was 26. So it's different when you're trying to coach a 30 to a 30 plus year old sprinter. So recovery day for me, depending on where we are in the season, it can be a long swim. It can be like a 4,000 yards swim. I like to do my recovery in yards. Or if I'm really broken down, if we're close to a, to a meet or if we're tapering, recovery can be just like some sauna and, and an ice tub, you know, and being doing contrast, you know, going to a hot tub and going to an ice tub and do that a few times. And get a massage, get some stretching, maybe go for a walk with the dogs. I think part of the secret of, of stretching your career past the 30s, it's not try, try not to stress mentally a lot. So all that long pounding yardage work, it, it stays behind a little bit. Well, I love hearing that you and your brain trust of talent and support of your career have collectively decided you're you're going to Paris in 2024. Is is that was that an oh, easier yeah was that an easier decision because it's three and you know two two and a half years and we're there basically is it an easier decision because it's so it feels so it feels closer. I just think it's a gift from the universe the fact that this next uh, this next season is going to be this next cycle is going to be a three year cycle you know and I mean again coming back home with a medal with an olympic medal makes the decision much more easy easier so I'm, I'm excited about it and i'm also i'm also excited to be planning this big as you said three year two and a half year cycle instead of just trying to show just trying to show some work just trying to show that i'm capable of things on every single meet because that's exactly what happened coming coming out of london and coming out of rio I had to show, because I had these appointments at the Olympics, I had to show that I was worth the support, you know, either moral support or financial support. I had to show every time that I was worth the support. And now, I mean, we, we don't have anything to prove anymore. Now we just want to race for racing sakes because I love racing and because I do believe I can be champion. And uh, because, I mean, I do believe I can definitely be faster than, than my previous PB. So, I mean, what the hell, right? Anthony Irving did it he was a champion and he swam a pb at 35 plus a few months 
and racing in in Paris, I would have, I would be only the second oldest swimmer to to race this this fifty. That's so, right. Three years. Wait, it's, you're not. I thought you'd be thirty six, but you're going to be how old? Thirty five. I'll be I'll be thirty five. Yeah. All right. All right. I I'll like thirty five. The it's also Paris. I, I think Paris has an allure. And uh, I, it, it seems like a city that, that you fit into really well because you've got a lot of style. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, if, I, if I've ever been to a meet, you see you walking out after the competition is over. You always, you're always the, you always look like you, you're dressed the best of, of everybody. I, I think that's, I, you know, maybe, maybe it's that Southern Florida look. But uh, I've, I, I don't always know. Like, I, just, I just like it's just a way of me expressing myself. You know, I like I like to look good. You you feel good when you look good, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe we can match something to the something to the Parisian feel to the French vibe. You know, I also have very good friends in in uh, in in France. I was just talking this morning with uh, Amaury Levou, and uh, of course. Uh, Floham Manadou, who became he's not only a rival, but he became a good friend of mine. So I have all the good reasons to be racing in Paris. You're the you're an athlete that everyone wants to watch, and it's because you always get TV time. You're always in the medal hunt. You know, back to 2012, you know, barely missing the podium, but you've been so consistent. And you're consistent about what you want. You state, hey, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm doing. And, uh, and I think that's why you have the respect to your peers. They know where they stand with you. They know what you want. They know how to pull for you. Um, I like that you're stating you're, go you're going for gold and that you're, you're aware of the age and that it's not, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's very realistic because we've seen our, our buddy Tony do it. In, what, in terms of your, hur your biggest hurdles, like what, what do you see as a hurdle or would you let us inside your world and tell us, maybe what you would like to improve what's something that's like you're a sprinter this is this is me bruno fratis this is where i'm going to improve there are so many hurdles especially when you're talking about a sport like swimming right and uh of course there's financial support which is uh, we're still trying to figure this out in our sport and um also the fact that i think we're all trying to make swimming uh uh, sport a little bit more interesting to to the viewer to whoever's trying to watch on television which I mean consequently and eventually going to get of course we need to get my star better we need to get my I mean that just just overall overall uh, uh, speed throughout the race. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about racing guys like Caleb, like Rich Gomez, like Flo Hamanadu and Vlad Murzov, you, you want to you wanna be on, on the top of your speed in every race. And I mean, being 35 years old on my next Olympics, I mean, there's only one guy we know have done before and uh, maybe a couple, but uh, we're just going to have to figure out training and rest and being uh, injury free for the next three years as we go. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to, to figure things out, you know, with, uh, with Brad and Michelle and all my team. 50 free is, is a nail biter. It's that, it's that race that makes you, um, it makes you nervous no matter what sitting there watching it, your, your heart's like a jackhammer in your chest. Because everyone knows that if you make one mistake, um, that costs you medals, it costs you the podium. Um, take me inside the ready room. Can you can you give anyone an idea? Can you give our listeners an idea of what the ready room is like when you're standing among men, ready to walk out for a 50 minute freestyle? To me personally, it's just it's pure fun. Honestly, I mean just staring at people and start reading people, you know, and sometimes we goof around. It's just, I think every call room, but the 53 is just because of the sprinter personality. It's just good old dudes being dudes, you know? And uh, uh, it, for, for me, it's pure fun. I, I like to, I like to talk. I like to chat at a call room. I'm not the type of guy that's like 
extremely focused and poker face. Sometimes I slap myself. Sometimes I talk to people. Sometimes I listen to music. Sometimes I sing. Sometimes we're just commenting whatever's happening on the races before hours. So it's a, uh, for, for me, I've been in the circuit for so long. I've been in the sport for so long that uh, I just I just try to enjoy and appreciate every moment because it's just it's just it, for for me it's just beautiful and it came down to being thankful for even being there. You know, there's there's a part of it that yes, you earned it, yes, you worked for it, and uh, I mean at least myself, I'm doing something that it, it's unheard of. So I mean, 91, 24, 21s before. And just being that consistent and uh, I don't know how many swimmers in history have done three straight Olympic finals in the 53. I'm sure like for how I'm going to do Gary Hall, just like guys that don't even dare to put myself at the same level. But on the other side of it, it's just being thankful, you know, as, as you mentioned before, it's just there's a pandemic happening. A lot of people are not a, a, even able to watch this Olympics. And uh, there's a global crisis going on. And yet yeah, you're able to be, you're blessed enough to be there doing what you love for the biggest of stages. So especially in Tokyo, for me, it came down to be thankful, to be thankful about for, for the opportunity of being there, you know? Agreed. 100% agreed. And shame on me because Braden Keith sent me a text message and said, you're talking to Bruno uh, because he's the most consistent sprinter in, in history. And, uh, but he was unsure about how many times you had gone 21. Is it 94? You've gone 21 seconds, 94 times. No, that's, uh, that's, well, I know that because I'm a very close friend with, uh, Alexandre Pucialdi. He's a, he's a Brazilian coach and Daniel Takata as well, who is the swim stats guy. And, uh, we're very close friends and I keep, I keep hearing about these numbers every time they keep texting me and asking questions. Now also my father, my dad, he makes sure to write down every single time for every single race, ever since I was 11. So every time you hear Alexandre Pucieldi or Daniel Takata talking about statistics and swimming, they got it from my dad. <laughs> I mean, at least, at least the numbers about myself. So yeah, 91 times, 91 times swimming, 21 seconds officially, not not counting the times I went in practice. Uh, just a, as a shameless shout out, uh, Daniel Swimming Stats is a part of the Swim Slam ecosystem because um, he's an incredibly smart guy. But now I'm hearing that maybe we should have engaged and worked with your dad. It sounds like your dad's <laughs> on top of it a little bit more. I, I didn't maybe I, I didn't know that's where Daniel was getting his intelligence. No, no, no. Uh, my dad, my dad can only give you intel about about me, about Bruno Freda's statistics. I mean, Daniel has a has a much larger approach about everything swimming, not only my own races. With the, you know what the, the beauty is, the culture of swimming in Brazil is something that I think, uh, particularly in fans in the United States, feel close to, and it's because we've had so many uh, great names come here and train. And it's something we followed at Swim Swam when we launched our, our co-founder and editor-in-chief, Braden Keith, was always, he started out covering Brazilian competitions. He's like, swimming there culturally is it. And it matters here in the U.S. Um, that's got to be something that you're proud of. And, and I hope that you get back and tour the nation. All right, you, you, you've got to, do you, have you gone down to Brazil and done a series of clinics in the past? I'm that sure very proud of Brazilian swimming. We have a very interesting environment down there with the clubs and the national competitions and the, the national uh, club championship. We have three national competitions a year, but there's a lot we need to learn from the U.S. especially and a lot we have to improve. And the opportunity for clinics and the opportunity for athletes to to develop their image and their name and grow their businesses there. It's something that it's something that I'm looking forward to help improve over there. In, in the near future, if I want to see you race, where, where are you going to show up, buddy? Uh, oh, no, I, right now I'm thinking about resting, man. I have gone 10 plus years back to back to back. The, the only, the only break I had since uh, since pretty much the 2011 Worlds, 
in Shanghai before the London Olympics, the only break I had, I was either having a surgery to correct uh, shoulder injuries or, or uh, because of a shutdown, well, because of a lockdown due to the pandemic. So right now I just need some break. I need a break. I need some vacation. I, I'm probably going to stay out of the water for a couple months now. I'm going to be working some other stuff. And um, I mean, I plan on being on the next world championship for sure. And and whatever meet show, whatever meet pops up in the in the beginning of the year, probably we're gonna be going for some pro uh, pro swim series here in the U.S. I always love racing those, and uh, that's what what's gonna happen. For most swimmers, and in, and in swimming globally, it. People see a shoulder injury as a death sentence, but you're a prime example that that is oh, not. The, no. It's not the case. Uh, is it? It you know what is something? What do you do since you had shoulder surgery? What 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 is the key thing that keeps your shoulders in place? Because you're you're putting enormous RPMs pressure on your shoulders. What what is it that you do that that keeps your shoulders healthy? Yeah, and I'm a straight arm freestyler. Right. So I do a lot of straight arm freestyle, which puts a lot of pressure, not only on the shoulders, but also on the elbows. But um, it's just a lot of prehab, a lot of recovery, a lot of uh, there's it has a lot to do with the uh, eating as well. I try to avoid inflammatory foods the, the most I can. I mean, not only I mean, of course, um, out of uh, I'm away from uh, alcohol, from fried food, from uh, refined sugar, and uh, working on icing my shoulders and doing my my stretch cords before before swimming. So it's a uh, it becomes part of your routine, you know. You're on top of it, and you, 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 it sounds like you, you can't back off from it. You're always mindful, and uh, and you see that at the top. You see that among elites. It's um. Yeah, it's a learning process. You know, every every season you you end up learning something new, and your body you have to you have to listen to your body and and really understand what your body is trying to tell you. You know, we, usually when you have an injury, it's your body telling you you need some rest, and then you need to give rest to it, and then you have to like make sure you strengthen your shoulder, your mobility. It's at some point, so you, it's it's just like a race car. You learn how to tweak it. You learn how to. How to how to manage it? All right, buddy. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy that you have your Olympic hardware, individual Olympic medal. Do you have any parting thoughts for us? Any thoughts? Not really. Just uh, just people be appreciative of, of of this sport that teaches so much, that teaches life skills, you know, and values and. Uh, such a beautiful sport. I want to. I want to see it growing, and I want to help it grow as much as I can. So it's a it's a beautiful community we have, and uh, I'm really proud of being part of it. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.